So I'd uh, like to take the opportunity to welcome you all to the Royal and thank you very much for coming out this evening. Um, we have an exciting presentation and hopefully when you leave you'll have a little more knowledge on mental health and, and recovery in the recovery process. Um, my name is Heather Masso, I'm the manager of the recovery program at the Royal. I consider myself um, very fortunate to work with such an amazing team here at the Royal. Um, and I also consider it a privilege to work with individuals who come through the door of the recovery program, um, many with little to no hope. Um, you see them getting well, um, you see them achieving their goals, and then at, at the time of discharge you realize how much that they've achieved. Um, so tonight we'll do a little presentation. We have a couple of videos for you to see. I want to leave enough time at the end for questions um, because last time we did the pr presentation last year there wasn't enough time. Um, I'm going to start off just by introducing Dr. David Atwood. Uh, Dr. Atwood is a loyal but expatriate Newfoundlander completing his MD in 1994 at Memorial University of Newfoundland. Uh, he did his residency in psychiatry at the University of Ottawa, achieving the fellowship of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons Canada in 1999. He's had, held multiple clinical, academic and administrative positions in Ontario, British Columbia and Newfoundland, and experiences uh, range across adolescent, his experience range across adolescent mental health, emergency psychiatry and crisis intervention, early psychosis intervention, treatment refractory psychosis, correctional psychiatry, secure care and assertive community treatment teams. Uh, he served as clinical director of an early psychosis intervention program, medical director of a provincial psychiatric hospital and clinical chief of psychiatry from a provincial health authority. I personally um, have had the pleasure of working with Dr. Atwood for the past three years. Um, he came to the recovery program and has been able to partner with myself and our team uh, to make the program the success it is today. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, uh, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks all for coming. I know we're up against the uh, Canadians and Rangers tonight. Um, <laughs> and uh, so even with that, you all managed to show up. Uh, so I'm flattered. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we're going to divide it into a few parts today. We have uh, several different presentations all in one. Uh, and so hopefully we'll, we'll stimulate you a little bit. Hopefully we'll try and uh, educate you a little bit about what, what we do. and. If nothing else, uh, we'll learn from you because you always ask the toughest questions and uh, make us think a little bit harder about what we need to do to make ourselves better. So, um, I'm reminded of how lucky I am to be a physician in this hospital. Um, I, I get to do things here that other doctors only get to dream of because it's the Royal, right? And uh, we get to take time. Um, but what has always amazed me is how physicians in particular, we're trained to identify pathology, make a prescription, and we have a tremendous ability to not pay attention to what's still not getting better. Uh, we pay attention to the effect of the drug. We pay attention to uh, whether or not the pneumonia has gone away or the drug response. But we, we don't ask about, is your life back to normal very often? And we're just not trained to do it. I'll apologize for myself and every physician you have. It's not really part of our training to, to ask about the quality of life questions. We're, we're illness-focused, disease-centric uh, physicians very often. And, and so it is interesting to work as a doctor and, and to, over the span of a career, to realize how little you actually know about life uh, and how important it is uh, not only to have an illness that might respond to a treatment, but actually get your life back. And so I put this slide up mostly to remind me about how sometimes I've been guilty of normalizing even the most absurd uh, reality. It says nature's a great compensator. You're probably quite a mountain climber. Um, doctor's ability to look on the bright side, even when things are bad, is sometimes a blessing and a curse. Um, in mental health, we've come a long way. Uh, so does anybody recognize this picture? This is uh, Bosch's portrait. It's called Ship of Fools, uh, done around 1495 or so. 
Uh, and of course, all the themes are religious, but each person there represents a different form of madness. And, and the sad reality was, is in the Middle Ages, this is actually what happened. Ships would float through you know, Central Europe, and they would pick up persons who were infirm or suffering, and they would literally put them on the boats and carry them away. Um, and, and this really has been, I guess, the saddest thing that's happened for mental health for all of eternity, is that we've worked uh, from a model of exclusion. Right? Uh, we've taken our people away, we've put them away, we, we haven't volunteered very often to bring them into our homes and our communities and, and integrate uh, all of us together. Uh, but the, the, the foundation of it is, is ancient and it goes back even to the Middle Ages when we didn't re really know that these things were illnesses, but we knew something was wrong. Around the 1800s, uh, there was a bit of a revolution, and certainly French psychiatry was where we probably started to really pay attention to the humanistic part of being a physician. And, and certainly Pinel was the fellow who pioneered humanistic treatment. And, and it was his belief, working in the asylums of Europe and things like that, that you could treat mental illness by simply being kind to people. Um, and, you know, the power of being kind is overwhelming, right? I mean, if you take the time to sit, if you take the time to be interested, uh, if you take the time to invite a family into your office, if you take those times and, and put the effort into being kind, it's amazing the wellness you can bestow independent of any medication you might ever uh, prescribe. But again, we're not really taught that very much in medicine, right? I mean, we try, and, but we're all busy and we're all struggling and we're all trying to do too much with too little time. But but the art of kindness is something that we, we try to teach and we try to embody. And I think here at the Royal, we, we make it part of what we try to do uh, as much as we possibly can in every given day. These were probably considered the dark days. Uh, I apologize for the caption underneath, but it is quite graphic. Um, the days of institutionalization where you know, we, we moved people into buildings and we, we took people out of their societies. And, and very often, independent of treatment, we, we did lock our, our people away for long periods of time. And I will say maybe on a little controversial side is that I am a believer in asylum. I mean, I think uh, the measure of a good society is its ability to take care of people who, who are at the point where they really can't take care of themselves. And the provision of asylum is something that I think we need to take responsibility for. But. But sadly, when we closed up these buildings, um, we didn't really replace them with very much uh, that would give people quality, safe, comfortable, uh, humanistic places to live and recover from, from devastating illnesses. And, and anybody who works in mental health knows that I think we've gotten better treating some of our illnesses, but we're still sometimes sorely deficient in, in how well we do. Um, there is a long way to go in treatment and even our understanding of these illnesses. Uh, and so when we close down these places, uh, and as happy as we are mostly that uh, we're not working from this model anymore, I do wonder, beyond institutional care, where is asylum for some of our people who truly need it, you know? And then the year of the medications came out, and is there any wonder anybody dislikes their medicine, um, you know? Um, the medicines were troublesome, and the medicines often bestowed some side effects that were worse than the illnesses we were trying to treat. Um, you know, so, and, and you know, right to this, to this day, the best medicine I have to give a person for schizophrenia is clozapine. Uh, and it was manufactured in 1958, all right? And so the best medicine in my cupboard is way older than I am. Uh, and yet that's considered the state of the art, right? And so medications have been useful. Uh, and medications allowed us to sometimes comfortably close up institutions and move into persons less perturbed by illness. But the question has always been is, is the person less symptomatic necessarily more recovered? And that isn't always true, right? Sometimes people are treated and their illnesses are considered responsive and you come and see your physician and your physician is so happy because your symptoms have gone away. But there's still that functional gap between the symptoms going away and you or your loved one getting their lives back. And so I thank goodness for medicines. There's, there's very, very little sometimes we can do without them. Uh, but the question always becomes is what do you do 
next. There's lots of strategies, and, and again, I'm really, really lucky. I work with a team of people, occupational therapists, recreation therapists, psychologists, some of the best nurses I've ever seen kind of thing. So again, you get a sensitivity and expertise in staff here that you don't see uh, in many places kind of thing. Uh, but you know, we, we did spend many years doing analysis for people, which was great because the doctor got to understand completely why you were sick. But you might not have benefited from his knowledge. Uh, just hours and hours of talking about what the illness experience is like doesn't always necessarily bestow wellness. And so what we've begun to discover is that keeping people in their families, keeping them in their lives, keeping them functional, keeping them in jobs that are meaningful, in homes that are decent, uh, uh, really is probably more rehabilitative and reintegrative and recovery focused than anything we thought we were doing over the last several hundred years. And so I deal mostly with schizophrenia and the recovery program is not a schizophrenia program even though probably about 80 percent of our patients do have some form of schizophrenia. Uh, but when you talk about the recovery program per se, we were a residential inpatient recovery program, which is a little bit of an oxymoron in a sense, right? Because very few people who are ready for psychosocial rehabilitation need to get it in a facility, right? And so mostly we would like people to be coming for outpatient programs and groups and then going home at the end of the day and exercising and practicing what they've learned all day within the confines of the, of the lives that they have to live. That's a good way of, of, of transmitting skills. Um, but for a certain number of people, particularly people who suffer schizophrenia, finding that safe home, that reliable home, that reliable place to live to go back to to practice whatever skills you might have learned in your, your rehabilitation or recovery program is sometimes lacking, uh, to say the least. If you've done a tour of social housing in Ottawa or any major city in Canada, you know that even the places that are considered good are, are sometimes a little nerve-wracking, right? And, and I know some of the people who work in and, and manage some of these places. These are exceptional people are running these places, but they are doing it with very, very little uh, in terms of resources and often very little support. Um, but schizophrenia itself, this is a heck of a disease. This is one in a hundred. So like this is more common than juvenile diabetes, but less common than type 2 diabetes. And like there isn't a found, there isn't really a home lottery for schizophrenia, right? Um, so it is difficult to sort of uh, promote it. We talk about 24 million people around the world have this illness. We talk about 240,000 Canadians. I mean, within the Champlain, there's probably around 20 or 30,000 persons with schizophrenia or a form of it, you know. Um, every year, so I ran an early psychosis program for a while, and every year you basically take the number of people in population. We have about 1.2 million. And so for that 1.2 million, we're expecting between 20 and 25 people per 100,000 to develop the illness new every year. So it's relentless, right? It doesn't stop. And nothing we've ever done has stopped the flow. The, the incidence and the rate of schizophrenia has been fairly con uh, constant for a couple of hundred years that we've been measuring it. The illness itself, I mean, we talk about recovery and we talk about doing cognitive behavior therapies. Uh, but the cognitive deficits of schizophrenia occur before the person even knows they're sick very often. Uh, the history I typically take is a person is in high school and they're doing fine and then around grade 9 or grade 10 their marks start dropping and they stop going to school and they start smoking a little pot and then something really bad happens. But the cognitive part happens before the illness is ever really apparent, right? And yet, the hallmark of what we do is cognitive. It's exercising. It's getting people to exercise their brains. But before the person ever sees someone about their mental health, they've already begun to experience some of the cognitive deterioration of the illness. We know before people get ill, 20 to 50, 25 to 50 percent of people have some kind of, of pre-morbid uh, difficulties with adjustment. Anybody who's read the uh, Adverse Childhood Experiences work um, fascinating uh, papers to read, uh, but certainly persons who have adverse childhood experiences, no matter what happens, whether they get diabetes or depression or schizophrenia, the adverse childhood experience predicts that they're going to have a harder time recovering, right? And so if persons aren't adjusting before they get sick, adjusting after you get sick is more difficult. 
Certainly we know the longer you're ill and the more often you get ill, the more difficult it's going to be to recover. And the numbers are fairly constant. I mean, about half people have reasonably good outcomes and the other half have significant struggles. Now, what we consider to be a good outcome varies. But, but the cost for treating schizophrenia is greater than the cost for treating all cancers combined. Wow. Allow that to sink in, too, for a second. All right? So, devastating social footprint on us all for an illness that's voracious. Uh, we've been prescribing medications for um, for 60 years now, and the basic bottom line is not everybody responds to treatment. About 28, 30, about 30 percent of cases are treatment refractory. That means they don't respond to two antipsychotic medications. Uh, responding to some kind of medication seems to be a prerequisite, though. It's difficult to do very much else if your symptoms aren't going away at least a little bit. And we talk about clozapine a fair bit, but even by the time you get on clozapine, which we take way too long to get people on clozapine, um, but by the time a person does get on clozapine, even then 30% of people don't respond to the medication. And so what do you do with this illness? Uh, there really isn't a domain of a person's life that schizophrenia doesn't impact. And then we come up with great treatments that cause obesity and sedation and drooling and diabetes and, and things like that. So the good treatments, the best medicines we have, all have tough side effects. And yet most people are willing to take tough medicine if they work, right? But again, whether your symptoms go away is one thing, but getting back into your life uh, is the other thing. And that's really what I've become to focus on. And that's why I work in the recovery programs, because long after you stop thinking about medicine, you have to think about getting people back and doing something meaningful. Um, because this, this is a hell of an illness. It is hard to stay on track. There are a lot of distractions. And I don't mean to, when I looked at this slide, I thought I might be partially offensive to the on-track program. Anybody knows the on-track program? <laughs> <laughs> Those are my friends. I don't mean to, mean to be offensive to the on-track program. But it is hard to stay on track. There's a lot of distractions, right? These are hard medicines to take. Not many people want to take them. Not many of my patients think they're very ill. I mean. And so why take a medicine that doesn't make you feel so well? Why stop smoking pot? It makes you feel pretty good, right? I mean, you know, it's, there's so many deviations that take you off the course of the straight and narrow recovery. And then so many people blame the patient, right? Well, he's just not motivated to get better, but, but this is a hell of an illness, right? And so it's not necessarily that the person isn't all that motivated to get better. It's maybe getting better isn't easy. Right? Maybe it's not a matter of just taking your medicine. Right? And, and for anybody who that's a surprise to, I'm sorry to break it to you. Right? I mean, it is complex to get better. This is basically what happens after the first episode. And very few people get sick once with a psychosis and get better and never need treatment again. It's probably around 10 to 15% of people. So that gray bar. But really, about 10 to 15% have an episode of psychosis and it goes away and it never comes back again. And I'm so happy for those folks because psychosis itself is traumatic, right? I mean, the, the actual content of psychosis is, is traumatizing. And, and to be able to only have it once is sad, but, but it's a relief. But very few people actually only have it once. And most people who have a psychosis have a psychotic disorder. And so, but you know, it's not all bad. I mean, I, I have people with schizophrenia, for example, who are CEOs of corporations, you know? Uh, and I have people who have much different lives than being the CEO of a corporation. Uh, but you know, there is about a third of people who develop schizophrenia who go on and they have a pretty reasonable life. They have the occasional episodes of psychosis, but between the episodes, they're not terribly symptomatic. They often work, they can often hold down a relationship and, and do pretty well. And then occasionally they have a flare up and, and they, they, they treat themselves. I mean, a majority of the people we treat here at the Royal are the second bearer, you know, the multiple episodes, the people who don't really go into remission between episodes. And so even when your doctor's happy and you're well enough to be discharged, you still got something going on that shouldn't be, right? And, and that tends to be our wheelhouse, that tends to be our business here. And, and from a recovery program perspective, this is where we have to sort of say, hold on now, let's stop talking about more and more medicine. 
let's talk about what can we do from an occupational therapy perspective, from a peer support, from a gym, going, let's go play volleyball, right? And, and sometimes it sounds a little bit silly, but I have seen people get better from playing volleyball than I have seen from some of the medicines I've prescribed, kind of thing, you know? And so, so but this is where we are. And, and this, these are the people we target, is those folks who've had multiple episodes, and even despite getting the best treatment we have, uh, are still having trouble achieving some kind of measurable recovery. Uh, the last group are the folks who developed the devastating illness, and these, uh, these again, are, are, are folks we take care of, but often these are people who are too ill to even get here to the Royal Four treatment, right? And so these are folks highly marginalized, uh, you know, living in shelter system or homeless <coughs> programs or things like that. Uh, but schizophrenia can be devastating, and there are people who their first episode never goes away, and they live the rest of their life with it, and it is, it is quite devastating. So when we talk about how we're doing, I mean, the outside circle here is where doctors are trained to work. We're trained to get people to respond to treatment. And really, the response to treatment is that you're well enough to take off the blue hospital gown, put on your own clothes, and walk out the front door, right? That's not necessarily, are you better? That's not necessarily, are you back to work? That means you're well enough to go home. Okay, that treatment response. And I guess there's so many people banging on our doors that very often that's the end point of treatment. Uh, we get people to respond to a treatment and we say, okay, go follow up with your family doctor or go see your psychiatrist and, and work it out over time kind of thing. But, but the, the two inner scales here are, are more elusive and, and quite honestly, we don't often emphasize them even in training programs, you know? And so, to get the remission, to get the symptoms to go away is extraordinarily difficult. Um, I mean, these are voracious illnesses by and large, and so to get the symptoms to, to disappear often just doesn't happen. And yet, you know, we, we continue to try and, and use medicines and cognitive therapies and psych other psychological therapies, uh, but to get into that second zone is, is a colossal amount of work compared to the first zone. And then the part that we really don't talk about, and even to this day when I talk to learners and, and people in other areas who ask what I do, and we talk about recovery, well, most people don't know what it is. Um, it's how do you get recovery, right? Um, and recovery is hard, and recovery is elusive, and sadly, not everybody recovers. Uh, but recovery is what we try to do, and we try to bring it as much as we can, and we're never perfect about it, uh, but we do try and offer some people for getting their life back on track. You can measure it in multiple different ways, but it's basically some independent functioning, some work, some school, some meaningful relationships, uh, minimal symptoms, and a sense of well-being. Self-actualization is the word that, that comes up. So how are we doing? So Schizophrenia Bulletin published in 2013, an article that reviewed research studies done over the last 100 years, so back to 1895. And basically, again, I showed you a slide before that said about 50%. This is 40 to 42% had what were considered good outcomes. Not necessarily recoveries or remissions, but favorable outcomes. 13.5% of patients in 50 studies met what were considered to be recovery criteria. So one person in seven recovers. And what's really interesting is that the medications were discovered in early 1950s. And the number of people recovering pre and post the discovery of medicines hasn't really changed tremendously. Uh, the medicines reduce the burden of the illness, and the medications review reduce the expression of the symptoms. But still, the numbers are about the same in terms of people who are actually meeting definable recovery. Um, interestingly enough, there's, there's, a, there's what's called a poverty paradox. There's people who live in poor third world countries do better with schizophrenia than people who live in first world countries. And maybe it's because they don't get any help. And, and maybe it's just because you either get on with it or you disappear kind of thing, you know? Um, but it is a paradox and it keeps showing up. Uh, and really, our recovery rates have not improved. And that's why, again, some of us choose to work in recovery program, because we believe our recovery rates can and should be better than this. And so from my perspective, 
Uh, I mean, I schizophrenia is, is what I treat mostly, uh, and, and again, it's, it's the reason I'm a psychiatrist. Um, it is an overwhelming illness, and I think despite the amount of time I spend, the uh, doses and the amount of medications I prescribe, and the eye-watering cost of some of these medications, uh, it is the most humbling of all illnesses. And certainly, I've worked in early psychosis programs, and for all the time, and for all the money, and all the research that we do in early psychosis intervention, we don't seem to be spending the equivalent amount of time and energy in what happens after the dust has settled and the first episode is over and somebody asks the question, now what do we do? Right? And so I, I, I think we should be shedding more light and, and giving the now what do we do question a little more uh, urgency. And you know, it, it's psychosis, you know? And so just because you're logical, just because you're perva pervasive, just because you're right, just because you've said the exact right treatment, with schizophrenia, it doesn't mean the person's going to get better. Uh, it's one of those illnesses that you can know everything about and do nothing about, right? Uh, but with the team and with an effort, and if you surround yourself with people who are interested and enthusiastic and like-minded and persistent and not prone to burnout, um, <laughs> then it becomes a fascinating illness, set of illnesses to treat. Um, and so I think, for me, the recovery program offers an opportunity to, to enhance the outcome. The recovery program offers me a chance to do the things I really can't do anywhere else. You know? And so that's, that's why I work there, and that's why I'm proud to tell people I work there. And so, you know, this is where we start. You make it sound easy, right? It says, good, and now by simply shifting your weight, begin to carve a wide, slow turn across the slope. <laughs> The, uh, the recovery program has had some growing pains, you know. I mean, um, when people get to the recovery program, about half the people might think we're an alcohol and drug treatment program because recovery is an overlapping word, but we're not really an alcohol and drug treatment program. Uh, and, you know, we throw everything we have at people, and some people just sadly just don't do well no matter what we do. Uh, and then we have these incredible successes where people all of a sudden just blossom and become the person we, we imagine they could. And then some people get angry because they come for the recovery program assessment and we don't accept them. You know, because there's just too many other things going on that might predict that you're just not going to do well in the program and that the program is going to either stress you out or cause you deterioration or, or not build for what you need. So we're one little program trying to do a lot of things for a lot of people. Um, but still, it's a very fascinating place to work in, and I think we're going to move into, uh, uh, Carlo's going to give us a bit of a presentation. So I just uh, like the opportunity to um, introduce Carlo. Uh, Carlo is a peer support worker that works in our program. He's uh, been working with the patients in our program and our team for approximately a little over two years. Um, <clears throat> Carlo not only is an excellent clinician and provides patients with the support um, and guidance that they need to help in their recovery, but he he's one of the most creative people I know. Um, he has he does beautiful photography and engages patients in doing photography and other artistic. He has a lot of artistic talents that will help people um, to engage in recovery and and to also use these tools and skills when they um, when they leave the program. Uh, my name is Carlo. I am the peer support worker at the recovery program and have been sort of working and uh, shaping that position, that role uh, for the past two years. Uh, and I'm really, really feel it is my privilege to work uh, and walk alongside um, folks on their journeys uh, of recovery as they work at growing towards sort of a greater sense of health, wellness, independence. Uh, growing into themselves, into uh, a new a new version of themselves, um, and so that kind of brings me to the idea. Just um, actually, I want to mention before I get started that that movie that we saw or that we saw excerpts from uh, was put together by Ledbetter Films, uh, which create a, a number of films on issues surrounding mental health, mental illness, and. <coughs> Uh, often including the perspective of people who've been through it themselves and, and get to share what they've learned from their own journey. And so those were all people who had had their own experiences with mental health challenges, with struggles, and what they've learned from, uh, from that experience. And so I thought that was uh, helpful. I wanted to share what they had said because there's so much 
wisdom out there from people who've been through their own experiences uh, and have learned what's really worked for them and learned you know, from, from those people that Dr. Atwood mentioned who do go on and find recovery and find wellness and find wholeness. Well, what if we were to ask them what worked for them and see if any of that could work for us and the rest of the people who, who are also struggling. And so that brings me to this, just this idea of recovery. And I think I really resonate with, with some of the things that people said in the videos, uh, whether uh, it was Don or, or, or Linda um, or Mary Lou, uh, about the idea that recovery doesn't look like one thing. And this is something that's really been driven home for me in the work that I've gotten to do and the people that I've been able to encounter over these past two years the recovery program is just that for some people, recovery might be getting back to how I was before or getting back some of the things I feel I'd lost or that feel like they're not so apparent in the midst of the struggles. I feel like who I am is not so apparent. I want to get that back. I want to recover that. But as Don said, for many, it's not about that. It's about moving forward. It's not about getting back because the thought's been expressed to me in several different ways that I don't want to go back to how I was before because look where that led me. I don't want to do that all over again. I want to do something different. I don't want to ignore what's happened, what I've been through. I want to learn from it and become a stronger, better person to build on what I've learned from that experience and to find meaning amidst that struggle, amidst that challenge and that experience, which is something that I would say that for myself, I have absolutely encountered in being able to use my experience the struggles that I've been through to support and help other people. Part of the incredible benefit of that is it's helped me to feel like my experience now has a meaning well beyond what, what it was when I was going through it. Because if it can impact others, if it can encourage other people, if it can help other people to find the strength in them to move forward and to create that sense of meaning and wellness in their own lives, then that's an incredible transformation from the struggle that it was into something beautiful and something powerful. And so I guess I just want to share some of the things that, that, are, that have been really pivotal that I've learned from the people I've worked with over the past couple of years and, and that I found just come up again and again, both in my own journey uh, and the people I get to walk alongside. And one of them, as Dr. Atwood mentioned, is this idea of quality of life. I still remember when I first started out my own journey, my own struggles, I didn't trust the mental health system. I'd read all about the things that Dr. Atwood had presented and more of just how things didn't work and why should I trust anybody? Why should I trust this system that from what I've read doesn't really help people? And then one day I met a doctor, I met a psychiatrist who surprised me by, by saying that the goal of what we were trying to do together was not just about the absence of symptoms and the absence of side effects but that it was about quality of life. And that was a real turning point for me because that made me feel like I could maybe trust this person, that there was something in what they were saying that resonated beyond what I'd heard before and that that was a turning point. And so I want to remember that in the people that I get to work with and in the many situations in which I find myself that, that it is about quality of life, that it is about more than just fixing the obvious things, but it's about creating a whole and meaningful life. And how do we do that? And how do we encourage people to find ways to do that for themselves? And so that brings me to the idea that is central, I think, for me in my job, um, and it's this idea of hope. Um, I've just seen how much hope can be a huge factor in how well people do. Because if you don't have any hope that anything can change, and if everybody just tells you that nothing can change, and it's just going to stay the same, and that you just better get used to it, then why would you even bother working for it? And why would you even feel that that's possible? But what if the people that were around you, like I think it was Mary Lou who spoke about it in the video. She's like, the occupational therapist believed that it was possible for her to move forward and, and attain some of these goals. And because she didn't doubt it, Mary Lou didn't doubt it. This idea that if the people around, and that includes me as a peer support worker working in a setting where whether I want it or not, the people I serve will see it as I have some kind of authority. All of us who are serving people in the mental health field have some kind of authority. And if these people who have authority can hold on to some sense of hope that things can get better, 
then maybe people can develop a sense of hope for themselves. Maybe, maybe that'll seep in. I can't force anyone to have hope. I can't make them have hope. But if I hold hope for them and allow that to inform how I talk to them, how I work with them, how I walk alongside them, then maybe they can develop that a little bit for themselves. And maybe that'll have an impact on how well they do. And I think what I've also had to learn is that hope for me, I have to be cautious about making it too specific. If I say, well, I have a hope for you that you will achieve this particular goal, and they don't achieve that goal, they might miss the fact that they've achieved other things. And so for me, the idea of holding hope is just this idea that things can get better. And that I don't know what that looks like. I can't predict the future. But I believe it can get better. And that if we keep working at it, there is a way. And that we can find it. And that's it. It's very simple. It's not always easy, but it's very simple. And so that, for me, is a foundation on which I build a lot of what I do. It's just the idea of a, hope in, a humbly hope-informed practice. And so that brings me a little bit to just talking about what my role has developed into being uh, as I get to work and collaborate with some amazing people on the recovery program who I'm very grateful to say have really sought out collaboration amongst ourselves and bringing me into the team, wanting to know what my expertise is, wanting to share their expertise and seeing how we can work together to really empower the folks that we work with to find meeting and to find what it is that will help them have a, a whole life, whatever that looks like. So I found that it's useful for me in doing that to facilitate a number of groups. So I facilitate groups, whether it's like RAP, the Wellness Recovery Action Plan, put together by Mary Ellen Copeland and the Copeland Center, uh, which is just helping people find sort of a set of tools for themselves to help themselves get well and stay well and promote their own wellness, as well as figuring out what might be the bumps along the road and how do I deal with those things. Make a plan for what I'm going to do when things get tough, when things become more of a struggle or start to fall apart. As Heather mentioned, I run a, um, a photo voice style photography group um, where I just encourage people to explore what it looks like to capture your own experiences through photography. Often an experience of mental illness is very isolating. You feel like no one can really understand what you've been through. You can't communicate it. They just don't, they don't get it. But through photography, I can show people how I see the world. And maybe that's some way that I can communicate. And sometimes that even gets the words going. When I can't get the words going on my own, if I can get an image that captures something, all of a sudden I'll be able to find what it is I'm trying to say. Or maybe they just find that they like taking pictures and that that's something meaningful to do. So that's something that I brought into that's been meaningful for me and that I want to share with those that I get to work with. Um, I also get an opportunity just to advocate for and bring up the, the concerns of the clients that I get to work with when we meet in team meetings. Just invite the rest of the staff to consider it. Often, they're not trying not to consider it. We just get caught up in all the things we, we're talking about and all the things that are on our mind and all the different aspects of what this care system asks of us. And so I'm just there to remind us and, and try and work together on that. So I get to collaborate with this team so that we can really support, um, support the clients in getting what they need and reaching their goals. And then I meet on pe with people one-on-one. -on -one. I get to just sit and chat with people and be with people. And we talk about what they want to talk about. We talk about their experiences, their aspirations, the challenges, and we, where they might connect with any experience or expertise I have or that I've learned from others who are also in their own journeys. Um, talk about what it's like to wrestle through stigma and self-stigma and how do you talk about what you've been through or not talk about it and how do you deal with it when people don't understand. And just to offer them the fact that I'm holding hope for them and see if that might somehow inspire them to find hope for themselves. And so it's really as simple as that. That's what I get to do. I get to walk alongside people to hold hope for them and to try and help them find what it is they need to move forward. And so we talked about hope. I think it's fascinating that I'm finding little bits of things that, that I'm reading where it actually says that Research findings document that individuals who use peer-run services have decreased hospitalizations, suicide rates, and substance use, an increase in social contacts, 
ability to carry out activities of daily living, and a positive impact on participants' recovery, including an increase in their empowerment, hopefulness, and informal learning of adaptive coping strategies. And if you think about it, that actually makes sense. Because if you, for example, suffer a loss in your life, who best is going to be able to comfort you but someone else who's experienced a loss? Someone else who's been through what you've been through. And if they come out the other side, then their wisdom rings truer because they know at least they can relate to where you're at. So brings us the idea of wellness and that recovery can lead to this idea of wellness, wholeness, or just that you can be well even if life isn't easy. That you can be well even if the challenges don't all go away. But if you find meaning, then it can be well. It's the idea of being well beyond the idea of recovery. And so I find actually a lot of um, encouragement from the main uh, foundational concepts of rap in terms of what I do. Like I said, just the hope, encouraging people to take personal responsibility, to help them feel like they can have a say, like they can have an impact on their own wellness. Encouraging them to find out more things about their experience, about what might work, about what might not work. Educate themselves. To advocate for themselves. I talked about advocating for the clients I work with. Sometimes, and often, my first encouragement is to try and get them to advocate for themselves. Because then that creates a dialogue where all of a sudden they're working with the team and not feeling like they're at the mercy of the team. And that somehow both receiving and giving support from other people and to other people helps you to have a sense of, I don't know, belonging and being a part of something bigger. So I just want to leave you with this. This last quote um, from the December uh, 2012 issue of Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvements, Mythbusters. Uh, and I just thought this really interesting. It kind of captured this idea that a growing body of evidence is showing that recovery of a meaningful life, despite limitations imposed by illness, is possible and likely. People with lived experience have known for some time that with hope, empowerment, and support from others, recovery is possible. Promoting a mental health system that views both personal and clinical recovery as the objective can reduce healthcare costs, enhance quality of life, promote social inclusion, and help those living with mental illness lead full and productive lives. And so I just want to close there um, saying that I'm really grateful that you've all come out here to hear about this and to talk about this and participate in this conversation. We'll have some time for questions in a little bit. And so I turn over to Heather. Thank you, Carlo. So I noticed that we're running short on time, and I promised Dr. Atwood and Carlo that we'd leave enough time for questions and answers. So I just wanted um, to share a story with you. I, I started working with the assertive community treatment tr team on Catherine Street in about what was it? 2005. Um, I'd worked in psychiatry for a few years at that time. But it wasn't until then that I really worked with patients to support them outside of the hospital. And I no longer saw them as patients, I saw them as people. And we can learn in textbooks and through school that you know, you're gonna, you learn to have therapeutic relationships with your patients and you, you come up with care plans and you talk about their goals. But until you're actually out there in the shelters and until you're in the social housing and actually sitting with these people, you have, as a from a clinical perspective, I had no idea um, where a lot of these people were coming from, what kind of struggles they had, the poverty. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people struggled because they didn't have families who supported them or friends. Um, and so for those of you who aren't, who aren't um, familiar with assertive community treatment teams or ACT teams, it's kind of like people that support you and it's like a hospital outside the walls. Like, so we go around, uh, we visit with people, support them in their homes, support their families, and try to keep them out of hospitals. And for a lot of people, this is a great support and they're able to stay in the communities and be very successful, hold down jobs, and uh, raise their families. Um, but for some, um, 
for whatever reason, uh, there may be stressors in their life, there might be something going on with their medications, they may need a short inpatient stay. Um, so when I started working in the recovery program uh, in 2010, um, I was really passionate about the program because I felt um, as though I could look at these people as not patients but rather individuals um, and have a greater understanding of what, um, what kind of challenges they had out in the community. So, the recovery program opened uh, in 2010, in May. Um, we're located at the Royal Ottawa Place, which is a small building just behind the main building here. Um, the ROP opened up about 10 years ago. Uh, originally, it was uh, all long-term care. Uh, when I started, we, they did close down the bottom floor and wanted to start bringing in recovery patients. Um, so the purpose of the program was really to serve people <clears throat> in the community that had functional deficits which, and they weren't able to take care of themselves. Um, so, this, so they would spend some time with the program, usually three to six months, sometimes longer, um, sometimes a bit shorter, um, to be supported by an interdisciplinary team which consisted of uh, nurses, we had two social workers at the time, rec therapists, occupational therapists, psychiatrists, and nursing. So our thought was we're gonna get a team of people together that have that specialize in different areas and with a that holistic type of view, try and help people to achieve the goals that they want to achieve. Um, for those of you that have have had the experience of either working with psychiatrists and, and nurses and social workers on an inpatient or outpatient basis, um, it may have been frustrating for you at one point in time uh, to be to feel as though there were these goals from the clinicians working with you, but they kind of weren't your goals. So, like Carlo mentioned, why why should I be motivated to do this? Uh, this is not important to me. So we try to work with people on their individualized strengths, what their goals are, to try and achieve those short-term and sometimes long-term goals uh, during their short stay. So who do we serve? Uh, patients in the Champlain Lynn between the ages of 18 to 65, although uh, we, we have had some youth in the program. Usually the patients who, um, who come to the program either have a chronic persistent mental illness or um, have been diagnosed through the first episode program um, or the youth program with usually a diagnosis of schizophrenia or psychosis. The program is voluntary, uh, which means that people who come to the program come because they want to. The referrals are usually discussed with their physician um, or clinician prior to them coming. And uh, once the referral is filled out and we receive it, uh, there's a team, um, including Dr. Otwood's part of our intake team, so we'll look over the referrals um, and determine whether or not this is somebody that um, would benefit from the program. Um, and then. I think we're pretty lucky, actually, with the way we do um, our intake. We we sit with a patient for an hour to an hour and a half and really talk about very. We talk a little bit about history because that's important, but it's really about here and now and what their goals are and what they want out of the program. So, how do you know an individual is ready to participate in the program? It really varies. Um, we've had patients come to the program that are quite ill, have quite a few symptoms, but are motivated and able to participate. Uh, we've had other programs, or we've had other patients that have come to the program that are very uh, motivated, but really can't identify goals, and that's really just a part of um, their illness. And Dr. Atwood spoke earlier to the, the, the complexities of, of the illness, uh, mainly with schizophrenia. So really the goals of the program are to identify what your goals are, to work with you to achieve those goals, um, and usually we know people are ready for discharge when they've, they've identified you know, three to four short-term goals and started working on their long-term goals. Uh, this is a quote that I've added to the slides, um, and I think one of our psychiatrists, Dr. Baines, uh, this comes from one of her patients uh, that she worked with in the program. It's not really helpful to do activities just for the sake of doing something, but to really make a difference, uh, it has to be meaningful. Um, and we see that a lot in the program, and that's why our programming, we have quite a bit of programming, and there's a lot of different types of programs because people's goals are so different. Um, for instance, somebody might uh, first come in 
really hard for them to engage, not a lot of motivation, but they're able to work with Carlo because he's able to offer something that um, maybe Dr. Atwood or I can offer them. Um, and then he's slowly able to work with them to develop some goals and they'll move on from the photography group and start working on rap or start working um, on, on other programs such as we have a lot of, a lot of different recreational programs. Um, but their goals when they come into the program are not always necessarily the ones that they leave with. So it's really, it's really a period of growth. Um, so I mentioned when I first did my introduction that I feel privileged to work with the people who walk through the doors of the program, both the staff and the patients. Um, I have, we have a special guest here this evening, Luke, um, who's going to share his own personal experience uh, in the recovery program. Um, I'm very proud of Luke's successes. He's done a lot of great work since being in the program and he's now um, a member of the Client Empowerment Council and has been doing some excellent advocacy work for our clients in the recovery program. Hello everyone, uh, please bear with me. I'm very nervous right now and uh, I don't do crowds very well. So, um, <clears throat> I guess I'll start off with my name. My name is Luke Gilmet, and I was a client in the recovery program in 2011 for five months. Now, when I came in to recovery, I was severely depressed and my delusions were very, very prominent, but I didn't share them with anybody at the recovery unit. Uh, I was extremely secretly suicidal. If you've ever met me, my wrists are slashed and I have committed or tried to commit suicide before. So uh, I didn't tell anybody because I knew they would hospitalize me right away. So uh, yeah, that, that was not a very good period in my life. I had no supports except for the psychiatrist, uh, Dr. LaBelle, who, who uh, brought me into the recovery unit. And uh, I told my dad when, uh, when I was uh, just bring, or gonna be put into the uh, recovery unit that this was my last hope. I was not gonna stick around for very much longer if this wasn't gonna work out. So life in recovery. Um, I'll just tell you a quick story that, that really changed everything for me. Uh, I was, Dr. LaBelle had, uh, had put me back on Abilify, which I had taken before, and it didn't do anything. So my delusions are treatment resistant, so I am always on, and they're always on, and uh, I live with them every day. So I was put on Abilify, and I then, at, at the time, Heather was my nurse and uh, for, the day, for the day shift, and uh, I told Heather, I will take all my medications except the Abilify, and I will not be taking those medications because that is not working for me. So that went on for two days, and then Dr. LaBelle on a third day came to me and said, okay, we'll try something different. So he put me on Cymbalta, and within a week, it was like a light went on, and I just was back to normal again within a very short period. So at that point, I was very determined to get as much out of this program as I could. So with Heather and uh, the social worker and the occupational therapist, I was always um, trying to get some resources or uh, attending all the programs and just really getting as much out of, out of it as I could. And I made a few friends, which um, went on outside the hospital, and uh, they still remain really, really good friends. And while I was in the hospital, I decided, well, I got a lot of time on my hands, so I'll try my hand at volunteering. So I started volunteering at the Royal uh, as a, just a book cart clerk. And uh, I did that, and um, I started expanding from there. I wanted to go to the Ottawa Humane Society and uh, volunteer for them. And uh, right now I'm uh, the, um, I'm the um, I'm the driver for the uh, the PAL program, in on Monday mornings. So um, I've expanded my role outside uh, after after recovery, 
by taking on more personal responsibility in my life. So I, um, I stopped doing the book cart and I, I decided to try my hand at the, the Client Empowerment Council and uh, I was voted in for vice chair and recovery representative. So I did that and I wanted to take on even more responsibility. So I, um, I went to the PSO or the Psychiatric Survivors of Ottawa and, and became a peer supporter through them. And uh, my friends outside, uh, both uh, Severio and uh, Chris, whom I met in recovery, uh, they were, I'm still really good friends with them and we hang out as much as we can. So there was another medication change that made me even better. So my first medication that I was changed to uh, in the recovery program was Cymbalta. And after, um, I, I, asked my, I asked Dr. LaBelle again if I could change from Respiritol Consta, which is an injection, to um, Zeldox, which really, really works well for my depression. So um, I guess that's about it. Um, I just, I'm, I'm, I was laid off recently, so now I'm looking into second careers and uh, getting on with that and maybe going back to school. For me, school is an escape from my delusions. So I really tend to uh, do well and thrive in school. So thank you very much. Thank you, Luke. And you didn't sound nervous at all. <laughs>